Hello and welcome to the OptometryStudents.com podcast, episode one. My name is Peter Jacques, and I'm an optometry student at the University of Missouri St. Louis College of Optometry, class of 2019, and the editor in chief of Optometry's premier website for student life, OptometryStudents.com, where all the content is created, edited, and published by optometry students just like you from across the United States and Canada. We've created the OptometryStudents.com podcast to further improve the profession of optometry by better educating and preparing students to enhance the lives and vision of their patients. So without further ado, tonight to kick off the podcast, we have two very special guests, Jonathan Jacesco and Shane Stevens, and we'll be talking with them about their upcoming project, which is a book of optometry poetry. Jonathan Jacesco, who's the author of the book, grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 2003 with a Bachelor of Science degree in English, or as he likes to say, a BS in BS. He then completed his Master's in English at the University of Maine. He earned his wings of gold as a naval flight officer in 2006 and completed multiple deployments to the Middle East, Europe, and Central America. After 10 years of active duty in the Navy, he enrolled at PCO on a Navy HPSB scholarship. As a fourth-year student, he is currently the National Liaison for AOSA to the Armed Forces Optometric Society. So welcome, John. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Now, Shane Stevens who did the illustrations for the book, grew up in Newburyport, Massachusetts. In 2014, he graduated from the University of New England in southern Maine, majoring in medical biology. After graduating, he stuck to his home state and currently is a third-year student at the New England College of Optometry in Boston. And apparently, he only goes to schools with New England in the name. Along with some fellow students, he recently got back from his second independent optometric mission trip to northern Peru. He enjoys long walks up mountains, art, music, and writing. So welcome to the show, Shane. Hey, Peter. So Jonathan, tell us a little bit about Opto Poetry, how to get started, and what was your inspiration? Sure, Peter. Uh, Opto Poetry is a forthcoming book of uh, eye care related poems. Uh, the book is going to have roughly 50 poems and drawings, and there's also some other fun activities, including eye care related mazes and coloring pages. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Shane's one of the key illustrators for the book. Uh, there are some other students involved, uh, specifically Cheryl Dong from the Southern California College of Optometry, a couple of my classmates from PCO, Leanne Laporte and Jenny Kreck, and also Alice Lim. She's a PCO student as well, the year, a year behind me, and then also Brad Ehrlich at the Western University College of Optometry. So this is a team that that is now across the country, basically, in, in optometry schools across the country. How did you all come together to start working on this? Right. So once I decided to you know, take some of these poems I had and make a book, I thought to myself, like, oh, I can draw, I can sketch a little bit, uh, at least well enough. I'll just do this as a solo project. And then I just started writing more and more. And I realized uh, as I tried doing even just one drawing that turned out terribly, I was like, there's no way I can handle this. And I'm sure there are better artists out there. So I kind of reached out through my uh, optometry student network, you know, talking to friends, posting things online, just really kind of an open call for artists in the optometry student community. Uh, I had a fair number of folks volunteer, but uh, the folks that are ultimately going to be in the book are the ones who really stuck with it. I really appreciated the hard work they put in to you know, do these drawings during their spare time. Uh, so that's really how it all came to be to get, uh, to get the team together. So Shane, how did you and John meet? Yeah, like you said, he, he posted to, I think it was the Optometry Student Network on Facebook. Um, I think I emailed him within like three minutes <laughs> because this is, this is really like right up my alley. Um, I'm, you know, when you're in school, you don't really have a lot of time to draw. So that I wanted, you know, this is kind of an excuse to get the pens out. Um, so, yeah, that's how he contacted me and um, we've been pretty successful so far. So have you always been a doodler? This was this was just something you were doing in your spare time. You know, you wanted you this was a creative outlet for you and then and then Jonathan came along and boom, this was perfect. Exactly, yeah. I I mean I started pretty young. Um I'd say when I was like three years old my drawings were probably probably better than most adults right now. Um and I continued like up until middle school. And then when I hit high school, I just all I did was really doodle in class. I didn't really pay attention. Um, while people were like daydreaming, I was drawing basically, I, it's, 
It was an outlet, yeah. And I continued up into um, college, continued doing some independent stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's always been a hobby. I almost went to graphic design school, but I kind of went this medical route, uh, followed my own interest, and figured I could do drawing on the side like I am now. So tell me more about, you know, you're, you're a doodler, you have this passion for art, you have this passion for drawing, you want to do it as a living. Was there any key point where you made the switch and said, you know what, optometry is is the route that I want to go. You know what? Talk about what that decision was like. Yeah, it was a tough decision um, because I I really like art, I really like writing, but I figured my interests are weighed more into science and into medicine. And honestly, doing art it's kind of a lonely lonely job. You're most of the time you're by yourself like in a studio by yourself. And I, I miss like the human interaction. So I figured, you know, I'll do it on the side. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of students have that same sort of path where they're passionate about something in high school, you know, whether it be art or music or, you know, what have you. And then there comes a point where you have to make that decision and, and it's a hard one. Yeah. So I think a lot of students can really relate with that. Uh, I know our listeners are just dying now because they want to hear a poem. I, I know at this point, if, if it were me, I'd be like, okay, what what is an optometry poem? What does an optometry poem sound like? So, John, do you have a poem ready that, that you're ready to read for us? I do, Peter. I got uh, one right here. Just let me know when. Perfect. Yeah, just let us know what it's called and, and then go for it. All right, so this poem is about the images that you see uh, when you go to the eye doctor and you look uh, into the auto refractor. So I always thought it was funny how it's always either the hot air balloon or that little farmhouse that you see off in the distance. Uh, so I kind of imagine you know, what's really happening in that scene and you know, what's really going on there. So this is called In the Auto Refractor. Feel free to shrink me down so I can live in the auto refractor. I'd maintain my refractive farmhouse while riding my refractive tractor. I tend refractive chickens and feed refracting cows, just not while patients look inside so I don't distract them from my house. You'd be welcome to stop and visit on your refraction land vacation, but you couldn't spend the night in here since I can't handle accommodation. On weekends, I would travel in my refractive air balloon and float with my refractive friends to the re refracting side of the moon. We'll get there sooner or later is what we'd foolishly say, because the only problem in refra refraction land is that everything's so far away. That that is great. So there you go. There you have it. That that's an optometry poem. Optometry that's poem it. right there. There you go. So the, so there's an illustration that goes along with this poem. Uh, yeah. And this this illustration was done by you, right, John? Well, the, the version you've seen that was kind of a sketch I had done, and then okay. this is a good uh, segue into Shane's contributions to the book. Uh, he had done an update on that mock-up that I drew, where kind of the same idea of the, the house uh, in the distance, the hot air balloon. Uh, but one component I really like that he added was, uh, it really does place you inside the auto refractor. There's kind of like this circle off in the distance, almost imagine like a moon or a sun, and there's an eye looking in. So it's kind of like this you know, distant horizon where, imagine if you were inside the auto refractor looking at the patient and just seeing their eyeball as they're looking in. So it was really a, a nice touch that he added there. Um, and that's, I think, kind of what makes the, the illustration go so well with it. And, you know, the thing that I love about this poem, too, is that you know, I, I think as a patient, you know, everybody can relate to that, you know, whether it's the, right. the, the puff of air test, you know, or, or whatever. You know, they may not know that, oh, that's an auto refractor, but you say, right. you know, look into a, an instrument and look at a farmhouse or look at a hot air balloon and, you know, boom, instantly right. people can picture that. You know, anyone who's been to the eye doctor knows exactly what you're talking about. So, what was the was the audience for this for these poems was it was it just the general community patients doctors or was it more you know of uh you know this is just for students or this is just for optometrists or this is just for you know kids or this is just right. for everybody who's the audience right that's a great question uh the answer is both uh, but there's kind of a, a catch to that so writing these poems a lot of it was born out of you know sitting in class in optometry school I'd hear a funny word or a phrase, kind of write it down, and maybe that would inspire an idea later on. So all of these jokes, um, I think they'll be readily understood by people who work within the community. Even just in the poem I just read, where it says, but you couldn't spend the night in here since I can't handle accommodation. 
you know, to the lay person, they're just going to think like, you know, what does that mean? Like, why can't it's, maybe they think the machine is too small and you can't live in there. But for the people who realize that, you know, the whole point of having patients look far away is to reduce the stimulus to accommodation. That's kind of like this higher level joke that only the, uh, the optometry community is going to understand. So to kind of bridge the gap, what I intend to ultimately do is create a patient, I call them patient education end notes. So uh, basically all the poems are going to have little footnotes to them. Uh, and some of these things like that, they'll be explained in a separate section in back of the book. Uh, they won't be on the same page as the poem because that would interfere with the drawings. But uh, the idea is that if you know someone who doesn't work in eye care or, or hasn't been to optometry school wanted to you know learn more about this, they could really kind of spend some time with the book, read the poems, and then flip back and forth to really uh, get the jokes. And then uh, they're going to end up learning a little bit along the way. That's really cool. So it's the book is almost going to have a glossary with it, or, or you know, yep. a definition of terms in a way. Yeah. Uh, you know. So you could could you see just a, a kid picking up this book, you know, in the optometrist waiting room and and just flipping through it and then then learning something about optometry and then just getting inspired to go into. The, I mean, you know, did, was that sort of the goal of doing that? It was just to ins inspire people and help help lay people learn about optometry. Um, honestly, and not from the start, but once I made this little promotional booklet and I showed it to some people, uh, as actually at Vision X uh, at the optometry's meeting up in Boston. I just showed it to some people who were working there that, you know, aren't involved in eye care in some way. And, you know, their responses to it, you know, they liked the poems, uh, they liked the drawings, uh, but I know that they don't get some of the jokes. So I was like, how can I, again, kind of bridge that gap? Uh, so I think this would help. And if, if it serves both purposes, then that's great. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely some uh, explanation that's needed for the lay person to get a lot of the jokes. So did you have a background in writing? I mean, did you did you write a lot as a kid? Was this something that you were doing outside of optometry school already? No, not at all. I, as you, know, you mentioned in the bio, I'd gone to the Naval Academy and majored in English. But um, other than that, I have not done any creative writing on the side. Uh, I wrote a few poems similar to this during grad school, but you know, nothing uh, or not quite as much as this. So um, honestly, it's you know kind of like Shane was saying with the artwork where. He likes to do the illustrations as a side thing. For me, this is just a nice outlet, kind of another way to play around with the words and terms I was learning in optometry school. So there's actually a push uh, for you to write more of this. Uh, tell me about what happened, you know, to sort of give you the shove into writing more. Yeah. Uh, so it started in first year when I wrote a poem uh, and just posted on my uh, class Facebook page. And, you know, people are like, hey, this is funny. This is cool. I should write some more. And then over the years, I kind of wrote a few here and there and would share them just to get laughs from my classmates. Uh, and then uh, later in, I think, my third year of optometry school, uh, there was a school talent show, and I entered and read a couple poems and ended up winning first place. And that was really kind of the impetus where there was a larger crowd outside of just my friends and classmates saying, hey, these are you know good enough to at least win a school talent show. So um at that point, that's when I was kind of like, hey, I really should look into put these together into a book. And then really, honestly, the best period for writing the poems came right after I took part one of boards because I was obviously putting a lot of time to studying. And then once the exam was over, I was like, this is the time to do it. You know, I get all this free time back. And I get my brain back from, uh, you know, memorizing all that other stuff. So uh, that was really when I wrote, did a lot of the writing for the book. And you actually wrote a poem about boards, right? I did. There's a, a poem about boards that, that will be in the book. Uh, yeah, very much inspired by that. Are you uh, are you comfortable reading that one? Because that's one of my favorites. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Let me uh, pull that up here. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, that's fine. But uh, that's fine. I think if there's one, I think if there's one poem in this promo book that you're handing out at optometry's meeting that students can relate to, it's got to be the boards. The boards poem. I mean, when I came across this one, I was like, this this is perfect. Every, any student who's taken boards, I'm sure, can relate to this. Now, I haven't taken boards yet. I'm just a second year. I'm a little, lowly second year, but I know when I do. I mean, I, I'm talking to enough third enough third, third and fourth years to know right. that uh, that this is what it's like. So I'm the same boat. Got it. All right, here it goes. This is called Boards Exam Version A. When they told me to prepare for boards, I scarcely knew what to do. But to defeat boards, one must become boards and allow the boards to become you. So I took to forest and glen and glade, where seeds take root among shadowy shade, where tendrils creep in search of sunlight, 
for chlorophyll conversion to expedite. I walked among arbors of aspen and oak, tracing every leaf, every branch in brush strokes baroque. I ascended through shoots of xylem and phloem, parsed the pairings of every tree's genome. And once I knew these woods inside and out, I set out to discover what milling's all about. Were many toothed buzzsaws of nightmares horrific, plain and hue planks in a concert most rhythmic. I learned the language of two by four and four by six, how plywood is plied together from sticks. Sawdust filled every breath I breathed until in my alveole I thought I'd become half tree. Strapped, bound, and stacked upon a semi's flat bed, off to the lumber yard I speedily sped, where for months I weathered, forlorn and abject, until selected for some do-it-yourselfers project. And there I stood glumly, bearing the weight of the two floors above my ignominious place. There's little glory to be had, as you might presume, being stuck as a wallstead in the guest bathroom. But as seasons change, so do tastes and decor, and I was freed by way of a remodeled first floor. They thought they broke me in the demolition, yet I had finally completed my mission. I was abhorred by God from beginning to end, though the metamorphosis I cannot recommend. So I didn't feel the need to last minute cram in the days preceding my once dreaded boards exam. But many good brain cells died that day, my friends. My hippocampus especially needs make amends. And as I slunk from the test center, full of gloom and dread, I wished I had learned to be a buzzsaw instead. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that poem. Thanks. So did you, did you write that when you were studying for boards or when you walked out of boards or what was the inspiration for that one? I wrote that in the weeks after boards. It was not like I came home that day and, and wrote it. I think my brain was still a little too fried, honestly. So, um, yeah, uh, but that's another good example of a poem where, again, the, the optometry crowd is going to get that those jokes, like just talking about xylem and phloem, if you remember that from Biology 101. Um, yeah. yeah, those are the key parts of plants. Uh, and then at the very end, talking about the hippocampus, which is you know the, the seat of the memory within the brain. I think you know, a patient might pick that up in a waiting room and be like, yeah, they don't get that joke, but you know, the optometry crowd will. So Shane, have you done an illustration for that poem or is this, is this one that, that you haven't done yet? I have not done that one yet. <laughs> have you heard, have you heard that poem before though? Um, I haven't read that one. He's written you like, like he's written like 50 poems. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to yeah. catch. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so take me through the process of of illustrating a poem for John. Do you guys uh, talk about it beforehand? Is the brainstorming involved? Do you just read the poem and and take out a sketch pad and go? It kind of depends on the poem. Um, for most of the ones I've drawn, um, Jonathan has you know told me which ones he wants me to draw. We talk about it on the phone. Um, he'll send me like a like a rough sketch, like the one you saw the hub hot air balloon and auto refractor one and from there i'll kind of think about it um put down on paper with pencil and then if i feel necessary i'll like send him a picture of it and see if we need to make any changes and after that i'll uh, lay down the permanent ink and basically that's how it happens for those like those marquee drawings those like a lot of them are two-page drawings um, and for the other ones the other poems that he hasn't really mentioned to me. I, I read them, think about them, and um, if I have an idea and I'm comfortable with it, I'll give it my own take. So do you feel like when you read a poem and you really connect to it, is it because, you know, is because of an experience that you had in optometry school or it's just, you know, you're, you're reading, you're thinking about it, and then just something comes to you? It, you know, talk about the inspiration that you have for the illustrations. Yeah, it, when it comes to drawing, if I can see it in my head, if I can like visualize what's happening in the poem, um, it's easier for me to draw it. And for most most cases in which I really connect with the poem, it's because I've like like you said, I've experienced it in class, in clinic, um, with patients. Mm -hmm. So, did did you do any doodling of this type of optometry sort of campy, you know? things before just as an outlet or what what are your illustrations like when you're just drawing for you uh it's hard to describe it's a kind of contemporary graffiti-ish um uh, it's really, you have to look at it to be honest it's yeah <laughs> that's <laughs> anyway. that's the challenge of, of doing an audio podcast yeah. about written poems and drawn drawings <laughs> over podcast is not easy <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Describe your drawing. <laughs> so, but is there a, a particular style that you're trying to convey or, or is it just sort of something that's organically grown that, that you've developed yourself? Um, yeah, I'd say it's organic. Um, I am trying to intim- um, not intimidate, but mimic like Shel Silverstein. Um, mm-hmm. But when I was younger, I did a lot of, um, let's say, like Calvin and Hobbes. I'd kind of draw like that. The Simpsons. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Far Side Comics by Gary Larson. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of this is my um, stuff that I like to draw for sure. Shane, so you were familiar with Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Shane, it's funny you mentioned all those because those are like seriously all of my favorite artists. Really? And, like I read the same. Yeah, I'm a huge Calvin and Hobbes, Far Side fan, and growing up with The Simpsons, I was like, uh, I, mean, I, I can quote almost every episode. I mean, not literally quote, but I know yeah. everything about The Simpsons. Yeah. I love Far Side. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, it makes sense. That's why you guys drive so well. Yes. You know, having. <laughs> And you know what? I mean, our even our just ge- our generation in general, you know, those twenty, thirty somethings out there, uh, you know, who didn't watch The Simpsons when they were growing up, you know. Um, right. I mean, I don't know a lot of poets, but I know Shel Silverstein, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember reading those poems when I was a kid. And, and did you read those when you were a kid, Shane? Do you remember those illustrations? Because they were they are vivid illustrations that are that are very sort of ironic, you know, yeah. illustrations that go along. And, and do you remember? seeing those and, 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 and being inspired by those as a kid? Oh, definitely. I was, I have like a, I think I have all the Calvin and Hobbes like in one collection and I would, um, yeah, I would copy them. And like when I was hanging out, um, I can draw a pretty mean Homer Simpson. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Definitely inspiration. Sure. Let me, I, you know, I think this is so awesome and so creative that you guys did this, but you know, as an optometry student, I know other optometry students out there are listening to this, just thinking like, when do these guys have the time to do this? Like, I don't even, you know, I don't even have time to study and, and, and get ready for tests and for boards and all that stuff. How do you guys manage your time? Uh, I'll handle this one first. So I guess um, in terms of getting to this point, you know, with about 45 homes written so far, there were about eight to 10 I had done again over the first few years of optometry school. But then the last, you know, 30 or so that I've written, um, a lot of them, like when they, when I get an idea, like the best, my favorite poems are the ones that just kind of write themselves. So it really does happen pretty quickly where I'll be like, oh, this is a funny idea or funny word or whatever else that inspires me. And then I'll sit down and then sometimes like an hour or two later, or I'll I'll, I'll like sketch it out, you know, in class, kind of the the framework of the poem and then uh, come home and actually write it up in, in full. So it's not a lot of like staring at a computer screen. It's like, you know, when it, when the inspiration hits, it just kind of flows. So. Do you have a favorite poem? I know it's probably like trying to pick one of your favorite children, but if you had to pick <laughs> okay. one that was your favorite. Uh, yeah. My favorite one is it's called where do all the no shows go? And this was inspired by uh, sitting around, you know, I was a third year at PCO when we started to see patients in our clinic and you're just kind of sitting there twiddling your thumbs, waiting for these patients to show up. And then lo and behold, they're, they once if at some point you mark them down as a no show and you're like, man, what like what am I going to do now? You know, like, you know, maybe I'll have to team up with someone else for a patient. Uh, so and the, the reason I like that poem is because it has uh, kind of like two distinct halves to it. You know, the first part, it imagines the patients who didn't show up. They're out, you know, trying to solve a crime. And then in the other one, the other half of it. And imagines them, you know, with their lover, uh, as they've had this like once in a lifetime chance with them. So it's a little bit risque. I'll, I'll say that. Are you comfortable reading that one for us, or is that one going to be? A... It's too long, honestly. It would it would take almost too long. Yeah, it's it's lengthy. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But do you but do you think about that one when you when you have a no show? Is it just does it yeah. just kind of like resonate with? You? Yeah, and it's and I still think that you know I mean still obviously in fourth year of patient care now where. You see these people, it's like, why do they schedule these things and then not show up for the appointment? So not that I'm perfect myself with all my medical appointments, but uh, the if they yeah. don't call, it's like, why not? Everyone's got a phone now these days, right? Yeah. So is that one going to make it into the final book? Yeah. we don't. I don't have the illustration done for that one yet. Um, yeah, that'll definitely be in the book. Uh, it's a, Again, it's, it's long. It takes up almost two full pages within the book. So uh, even just fitting the drawing in around that will be a little bit of a challenge. So that would be a plug for the book, you know? Right, right. 
that, that's just a little teaser for for all of you to go out and buy the book. So when's the book coming out? What is what is the what is the plan for the books? Yes, you know, publication and all that. Yeah. So the plan is during the month of September, there's going to be a crowdfunding campaign through Indiegogo. Uh, it'll just be you know the title of the campaign is Opto Poetry, uh, and that's where I'm hoping to generate enough pre-sales to you know kind of get to a break-even point with the book, and then. Uh, once that campaign ends towards the end of September, we'll use October to finalize all the poems and drawings. And then in November, we'll send it to the publisher. And then uh, the plan is to ship all of the books out in early December. So um, it's kind of like a good stocking stuffer, essentially, for people who buy the book during the fall. It'll arrive in time for, for the holidays. So remind us all one more time that the dates that you can order it on the crowdfunding campaign are when? Uh, it should be launching uh, after Labor Day, so I believe that's September 7th. And is there a reason that you went with Indiegogo specifically? Uh, actually, the reason I went with Indiegogo specifically was because um, there are some charity stretch goals. You know, stretch goals are once the initial project goal is met, uh, you can have a stretch goal at which other things kick in. So uh, when I first looked at Kickstarter, they explicitly say you are not allowed to donate anything, to promise any of the funds will go to a charity. Uh, I don't know why they say that, but that's you know, part of their policy. Uh, whereas with Indiegogo, you are allowed to do that. So um, you know, once, you know, if the project meets its initial goal, then uh, after that, uh, a portion of the proceeds will go to a few charities that I'm sponsoring, essentially. Do you know what charities those are yet? Do you have an idea? Yeah, of what, I do. Which uh, one of them is a GoFundMe campaign for a classmate of mine, Kelly Morse. Uh, she was you know, going along through optometry school, doing fine, and then uh, she had a debilitating Ill illness. Yeah, I won't speak to it anymore at this point, but uh, once the campaign's up, people can learn more about that. Uh, so sure. there's a GoFundMe campaign for her uh, medical bills, and her family's had to take on a lot of uh, extraneous costs for that, so that's part of it. Uh, another charity I'm contributing to is one uh, that does have an optometry connection. Uh, Mary Dalton is the daughter of Dr. Mark Dalton. He's an optometrist here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and Mary has done some incredible artwork of her own that she's shared with the, the community through, uh, through the platform of ODs on Facebook. So she has her own Etsy shop. And I, actually, she had agreed to do some of the illustrations for the book, but then you know, with all of her medical care, it just didn't work out, unfortunately. But I still wanted to contribute to her charity, and she has a cancer, I believe it's called the Cure Search Cancer Walk, and she's raising funds up through October. So, again, anything that, uh, if we do reach a stretch goal through the crowdfunding campaign, a portion of the proceeds will go to her team. And then finally, there's going to be a donation to one of the uh, AOA's Optometry Cares charities. They haven't decided which one yet, though. But. So it's not just I'm buying a book to laugh a little bit about some optometry jokes it's right. this is this is really doing some good in the world so, so yeah, yeah. The, so so through the indiegogo campaign is that the only way that you're going to be paying for the publication or is there are there other funds that you're also right. going towards um, so initially uh, for that first month it will be just the indiegogo campaign uh but then once the book is actually published in december then the book will be, will be available uh, through Amazon.com. So I'm going through a publishing company that has connections essentially to Amazon, and then any book published through them uh, is, is on the website. Uh, and I'm also going to have a website up and running, www.optopoetry.com, and you can buy the book through there eventually. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's nice to have advantage uh, for this self-publishing connection with the website that has these Amazon links because then you can take advantage of, uh, they, they basically handle all of the shipping. So. so what's your dream for the book? I mean, is this something that you just want to see in every OD's waiting room or, you know, is it just to, I mean, obviously you don't write an optometry book to make a million dollars right? or anything like that. <laughs> well, yeah. know, why, why do it? Why do it? Really just to get laughs. I mean, that's how these poems started. Again, I just, that very first poem that I wrote was just to get a laugh out of my classmates. Um, so that's, ultimately the goal of it, just to uh, kind of uh, maybe highlight the culture, because there, there are some interesting cultures of being, one, an optometry student, and then also within each little optical shop, you know, all across the country, the way we deal with patients that forget their glasses, you know, they, they buy them and never pick them up, or they don't show up for their appointments, or the puff of air test. There's a lot of funny little things here that kind of make for this rich culture that's uh, uh, ripe for jokes. So. That's the main goal. Um, I do have an idea for a second project after this that 
then in this second project, I would hopefully get into every waiting room. It would be truly a patient-centered uh, educational book. So it probably wouldn't be as long as this one, but it'd be if it could be just like 20 to 25 poems where it kind of explains what's going on uh, for each phase of the eye exam. Uh, it would be something that, you know, as the patient's sitting there waiting to be seen by the doctor, they'd pick it up and maybe learn about, oh, here's why they're shining uh, the transilluminator into my pupils. Here's kind of what they learn. So if I can make funny poems that the patients would get, uh, I think it would be a great way to educate them about what we do. Are you planning on having students like Shane illustrate that project as well? Yes. Yeah, definitely has to be illustrated. You know, every, it's a visual society. We respond to pictures, videos. Uh, the poems themselves hopefully are funny enough, but it's the pictures that pull them in. Shane, I asked John what mm -hmm. his favorite poem was. Do you have a favorite illustration that you've um, done? Honestly, I think it's one that I have yet to draw. Um, we, uh, really? we talked about it a couple of days ago. He wants to do a um, like a Where's Waldo kind of uh, scene inside of a clinic. And I just think it's going to be... If I put the time into it, I think it's going to be really cool. So, so, so do you just you just have this idea for this illustration? Well, no, and the illustration that is yet to be drawn is the favorite illustration. I love that. <laughs> yeah, 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 that you're just so inspired by this concept that that is already your favorite illustration. How how many illustrations have you done so far for I the think book? Six or seven. Yeah. Okay, yeah, think, and yeah, so great. we're we're talking. 50 poems, you've done six illustrations. How many more are are you going to be doing? Um, well, like three of them are two-page drawings. I'm, I also drew the, the cover of the book. Um, Did you? Yeah, and I'd say I have the next two already planned out um, with Jonathan. And after that, I'm just going to try, before October hits, I'm going to try to draw as many as I can. And it haven't been um, done by other artists. Describe the cover of the book if you can. It, is it based off of a poem? Is it a inside joke of optometry? <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to take this one? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the at least the plan for now for the cover of the book, it's going to have it's going to be based on the one of the poems in there. It's called Doctor Thag, Jurassic Optometrist, and it's all the whole idea is about a caveman performing optometry on dinosaurs. Um, I think that is in the promo booklet. Um, and the idea I have for this cover that you know Jane, uh, Shane was able to illustrate was you know, a caveman you know, holding a pupil gauge, and he's standing up on a ladder, checking the pupils of a, a large dinosaur. And then the dinosaur's body wraps around to the back side of the book. And then on the back of the book, the back cover actually has a dinosaur-sized pupil gauge. So, so normally, like when you use a pupil gauge in clinic, I think it ranges usually from about 2 millimeters to 9 millimeters, about the size of most patients' yeah. pupils. Uh, but for these ones, I think the largest people goes up to like 50 or 55 millimeters. So it's kind of like, you know, the tie-in joke is like the, the back of the book actually has a functional purpose, you know, for being able to see your dinosaur patients whenever they come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Shane, when you, when you heard this concept for this Jurassic optometrist, I mean, what was your initial thought? I mean, did you just... Did you just laugh? I mean, were you immediately, were these images coming to mind? Or was this sort of the brainchild from John, this this illustration that's going to just just be the cover of the book? Oh, yeah. John's a genius of this book. Um, <laughs> I'm on board, though. I thought it was a good idea. So, I think the drawing yeah. came out pretty good. Yeah. yeah, great drawing. Thank you. So, John, I, <laughs> I'd love to have you read another poem. Do okay. you want to read... Do you want to read Dr. Thag, the Jurassic Optometrist? Or I, I have another one I'd love for you to read, too. It's totally up to yeah, you. let's hold off on the Dr. Thag one. That one, it's just because it's written from like a caveman's language style, it's actually kind of tricky. Um, so, Which is exactly yeah. why I wanted you to read it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, um, let's hold off on that one for now. I, I'll, I'll, we'll save that just for the book. Okay, perfect. Do you, do you have a fa another favorite poem, or, or are you yeah, want to pick one for you? Yeah, one that I like uh, is called the Puff of Air Test, and this is all about the non-contact tonometer, which, and I think if you just go to up to anyone on the street and ask them what do they remember from their eye exam, it's the air puff. You know, that's in some ways the most famous, it's the funniest, it's the thing that people are afraid of the most, unfortunately, and I think there are few and fewer offices using them, but 
Uh, it's certainly ripe for comedy. So here it is, the puff of air test. I have a funny allergy and I don't know how I got it. I just sit here in the testing room, an ordinary medical product. I thought maybe it was alcohol since I get rubbed down in the stuff, but when I grab a drink with the other machines, not once do I ever go puff. Then I wondered if it's the watts and volts running through my veins, yet I was symptom free that weekend when they forgot to shut off my brains. But just last Tuesday afternoon, during the course of normal operations, I had the bright epiphany that I'm allergic to the patients. As soon as they sit down and lean forward really close, I feel my symptoms rushing on as they look up my robotic nose. I can't quite pinpoint what it is that fills me with such unease, but once their eyes lined up just right, I cannot help but sneeze. So, yeah, it's a little disgusting, which I love. You know, it's very much in the vein of Shel Silverstein, which if you, you read his works, there's a lot of kind of little gross, yucky poems, and this one fits in with that. You know, I've never, I've never experienced a optometric instrument come to life so vividly nice. as the non-contact tonometer in this poem. I mean, I can, I, I mean, I feel like I can just, like it's a living thing now, and I can't look at an NCT the same way again now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to wrap it up, I, I'd, I'd love for you to read one more poem. All right. Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. It's the Donate to your local Lions Club, and I'd like for you to read that one just because it has a message, and uh, and I think the the overall message of this book is just you know fun and campy, but it's also you know buy the book and donate to a good cause. So so I'd love for you to read that one just to kind of close the show. Sure. Um, all right. So this poem is called "Donate to Your Local Lions Club," and there's a lot of terms in here that you know, the optometry students are going to understand. Uh, so here we go. I learned a lot of crazy stuff in all my years of eye doctor school. Tear film optics, Gaussian black boxes, and histologic molecules minuscule. Interleukin 17, tumor suppressor gene, synergesis of vitreous protein, plus the purpose of our spleen. But the strangest thing I ever learned, and they didn't teach it in my classes, is just how many lions out there could use a pair of donated glasses. That's awesome. And the Lions obviously being the Lions Club, which all optometry students are familiar with. So, yeah. John and Shane, thank you for taking the time to talk about the upcoming project and to I did you announce the new project? Did did people hear it first here? I mean, has has this been announced yet? You mean the the patient education book? Yeah, I had not really told that to anyone else just talking with a friend in clinic recently, but yeah, that's uh well, that's kind of the first time. There you go. Heard it here first, folks. Yep. Breaking news. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, well, I'm glad that our uh, student audience and, and our audience out there can uh, can know about that, so that they can they can support you and and remind everybody one more time um, what the dates are and when they can get the book and and how how they can get it. Right. So after Labor Day, there's going to be a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo.com. Uh, just look for Opto Poetry. Uh, you can also view some samples at www.optopoetry.com. You can, again, see some uh, illustrations by Shane and the other uh, talented artists. And then after Labor Day, that uh, website will also have a link to the crowdfunding campaign. Perfect. Well, thank you guys for coming on the show. And uh, and we'll have to have you back again once the uh, book goes live to to talk about the progress and then once the other project gets started. Sounds, Sounds like cool. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for the invite, Peter. And thank you all for listening to the show. If you liked our discussion tonight, please subscribe, like, comment, and share this podcast. You can listen to the show on YouTube, download it from SoundCloud or iTunes. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can follow optometrystudents.com on Twitter, at OPT Students. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. We are at Optometry Students. If you have an idea or know someone who would make a good guest on the show, please email us at optometrystudentsinfo at gmail.com. Again, my name is Peter Jacques, and you can follow me directly on Twitter. I am at your eye info. That's at sign Y-O-U-R-E-Y-E-I-N-F-O. Or Instagram, I am idocjacques. That is the letter I, D-O-C, underscore J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. And your clinical advice for the night is don't forget when you're young, 
We're generally against the rule, and as we get older, we generally become with the rule. Thanks, and good night.